Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this, the last of the Peter Wall Institute Emeritus College Nature Climate Emergency uh, Talks. Uh, we have about a dozen people, I think, uh, just admitted into the waiting room, and probably some of those are uh, still dealing with flashing on their audio or their, their video. So we'll wait a minute or two before I get things underway. Uh, please just be patient. Right, I think we should get underway. And before I start proceedings in any formal manner, let me just remind those who are with us already that there will be a question and answer period uh, after Nancy Langston's talk. And I encourage you to submit your questions in one of two ways. Uh, you might either enter them, uh, perhaps even while Nancy is speaking, on the chat function, uh, just type them in. I will monitor the chat and ask the questions of Nancy, not necessarily in the order that they're posed, but uh, with a view to trying to make the discussion flow forward in a, in a coherent way. Uh, but if you wish, you can also ask your questions on the audio function. You will have to turn on your audio uh, because everyone will initially be silenced. But please feel free to do that. And when you do ask questions in that manner, uh, please uh, keep them reasonably brief because I'm sure that we will have lots to talk about. Okay, let me begin this meeting then. Uh, and I'll do that initially by welcoming Nancy Langston, uh, an old friend of mine or a friend of mine of many years standing, I should probably say more accurately. Uh, and I'm delighted that she agreed to join us for this, the last in our very interesting series of talks as part of the Climate Nature Emergency Peter Wall in Emeritus College uh, Catalyst Program this year. Uh, I would begin by acknowledging that the Peter Wall Institute and the Emeritus College, like the rest of the UBC campus, is on the traditional unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And we acknowledge their stewardship and use of this land for many, many years before uh, others came to it. But I also recognize that we have people joining the conversation today from many other parts of British Columbia and a larger uh, range of places. And so please uh, do acknowledge in your own way the former occupants and users of the land on which you are currently placed. Thank you. Nancy Langston is a distinguished environmental historian. Uh, she was for several years at the uh, University of Wisconsin, uh, where she was a member of the, of the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies. But uh, in the last decade or so, she relocated to Michigan Technological University in Northern Michigan, uh, 
uh, hard on the shores of the Great Lakes, uh, and she is there as distinguished professor of environmental history. Nancy's background is one that really in some ways exemplifies the kind of interdisciplinary perspective that environmental historians take to the world. Uh, she completed a bachelor's degree in English at Dartmouth College and then spent a couple of years completing a DPhil at Oxford, also in English, before returning to the University of Washington, just south of us, uh, to enroll in environmental science for a PhD and then did a postdoc uh, in zoology. So Nancy has uh, published in scientific journals and she writes beautifully uh, and her work traditionally and characteristically uh, crosses the boundaries between arts and science and a number of other disciplines. Uh, she has written five books in the last uh, 20 or so years. The first two of those dealt with uh, places in the American West. Forest Dreams, Forest Nightmares, I still think of as uh, one of the classics of our field. Uh, and it deals with the ways in which foresters in the Blue Mountains of Oregon uh, really struggle to come to grips with the different environment from the one in which they had been trained, and as a consequence, uh, really mismanaged rather than managed the forest. Uh, that book, in many ways, set the tone for Nancy's scholarly career, insofar as much of her work has really very closely examine the uh, documentary and other records to make us think again, not only about human impacts on the environment, but the reasons why humans acted as they did. And Forest Dreams, Forest Nightmares, in my reading at least, is exemplary in not indicting the foresters for their struggles to manage the forest successfully, but in explaining it's uh, successful in explaining why it is that they struggled with a task that they ostensibly had been trained to complete. Uh, a second book on the West uh, was Where Land and Water Meet, and that dealt with the Malheur Basin, another fascinating study of changing occupancy of that territory and the ways in which uh, different uses really uh, each had. Uh, consequences for environmental change and, uh, and a whole range of other species. Then in a marked shift, Nancy moved on to a book called Toxic Bodies, which I think is really a resting reading and uh, it reminds us that for all of the institutional structures that are in place and ostensibly put there to uh, safeguard health and so on, uh, there are a lot of political machinations in the backgrounds of these processes that often uh, skew outcomes away from those that are ostensibly on the table. Toxic Bodies deals with the, the massive impacts of endocrine disruptors uh, on both human and animal bodies and tells uh, a really sobering tale of the ways in which uh, really it's very difficult to escape from these kinds of manipulations of the environment in which we, we exist. The second, the, the third, second and third books I've just talked about, Nancy then changed tack with her move to uh, Technological University in Michigan and began to focus on Lake Superior. And her fourth book uh, is a study of that lake and its changing environmental history. And the most recent work sort of builds on that and reflects a series of lectures that she gave at Brandeis University. Uh, it's called Climate Ghosts and it focuses on three species endangered by climate change. It really is that book, I think, that is a springboard for the talk today, which reflects Nancy's 
continuing research on these kinds of topics. But before we turn the Zoom forum over to Nancy, let me just say that uh, Nancy is one of those academics who not only stands out as a researcher, uh, she has also been distinguished for her teaching, and she has been a stalwart servant of the American Society for Environmental History. She served as president of that society in the first decade of this century, and uh, recently in 2017 or thereabouts in 2021, she was recognized with the highest awards of the society uh, for service to environmental history and for scholarly distinction in environmental history. So these are, I know, richly deserved recognitions, but Nancy's career has also won her recognition internationally. Uh, she spent a year before moving to Northern Michigan at uh, Umeå University in Sweden, where she was King Carl 16 Gustav Distinguished Professor. And at the close of that year, she received an honorary degree from Umeå University. So it's for these reasons and for the fact that I have known Nancy's work and Nancy now for 25 years, that I'm really pleased and excited that she agreed to wrap up our series of talks today. So without further ado, I'll thank her for agreeing to do this and uh, turn the screen over to our distinguished speaker, Nancy Langston. Thank you. Thank you so much, Graham. Uh, it's going to take me a few moments to share the screen properly. There we go. Advanced. Oops. Okay, so now can you all see the first slide? Perfect. Oh, okay. good. Great. Yeah, I want to start by thanking Graham for that incredibly generous introduction and also to thank the Emeritus College for inviting me. It's a great honor and a great privilege. I really wish I could be there in person, but as we all know, the carbon effects of flying around the world to give talks are outrageous. So Zoom makes it possible to share some of my research, and I'm much more interested in hearing what you all have to say as well. And I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm incredibly fortunate and grateful to be giving this talk from the shores of Lake Superior, where I've lived for a decade, as Graham mentioned. And I came up here because I had been doing a lot of research on Lake Superior as the so-called out-of-basin member of many Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission um, groups and by National Forum with the International Joint Commission groups and the opportunity to come to this basin and to be welcomed by Anishinaabe communities and by settler communities has been really extraordinary. Plus, it's great to be giving this talk right literally from the shores of Lake Superior. So in this talk, I'm mostly going to talk about a project that a new project which grows out of my most recent um, uh, climate ghosts book. And I'll be looking at tipping points in the north and focus in particular on reindeer and caribou. And that might seem a little odd, but hopefully it'll become clearer why I'm focusing on those creatures. I also have been doing a lot of painting recently, and this project will become an illustrated, basically a graphic history, a graphic novel of climate change and wildlife management. So to start with, in climate models, tipping points are critical thresholds that if we cross them, they can lead to self-perpetuating runaway warming in an ecosystem. Scientifically, they're typically called positive feedback models, but that's confusing to a lot of people because positive feedback tends to be a good thing in our normal lives. So societies, I argue, can also contain social tipping points where tiny changes in policies or behaviors can trigger our sometimes slow runaway warming. 
So in this talk, I'm going to be focusing on caribou and reindeer translocations across the global north as a very controversial tool for a green transition. So why am I going to be talking about reindeer and caribou? Because one, they're one species, just to clarify. But two, I argue that they are really critical partners in an effort to prevent runaway Arctic warming and the crossing of tipping points. And that's because there's this process called shrubification, which is a terrible word, but what it means is the expansion of shrubs across the tundra that is happening with warming. And we typically think more shrubs, more woody vegetation, more trees, a great thing. But in the Arctic, it's really problematic because they absorb long wave radiation rather than reflecting it as the grasses do. And what's really fascinating is reindeer and caribou browsing turn out to radically reduce the expansion of these brushy shrubs. So if you have reindeer and caribou on the tundra landscape, you increase albedo reflect effects, which means that you're increasing the reflection of solar energy, and that means you're cooling both local climates, and it turns out it can cool regional climates as well. So the presence of reindeer and caribou herds can, it turns out, lessen the possibility we're going to find ourselves teetering at the edge of an Arctic tipping point. So there's a little thing. So a little bit about caribou and reindeer. They're one species, they're a migratory species, and their migrations can either cover vast distances across the tundra, such as with the Barren Grounds herd in Canada, or they can adapt to much shorter migrations within boreal forests. They have the longest terrestrial migrations of any mammal on Earth. And those migrations have been key to the resiliency in the face of rapid climate change in the past at the end of the Pleistocene and in the face of rapid socio-ecological change. But now across the Arctic, their populations are crashing. And one reason is because their migration routes have been severed. They have retreated from roughly half their 19th century range. Their populations have dropped by about 56% in the past decade. Yet there's hope in this story because there are enormous partnerships growing to restore their populations across the North, which may be critical for resilience in a warming world. So translocating reindeer and caribou and lots of other cold dependent wildlife, but I'll focus on reindeer today, translocating them further north is going to be critical for resilience in a warming Arctic. And biologists typically consider two main forms of wildlife translocation. Assisted migration, where they're moving back to their original or longstanding historic migration routes, but you're helping them around things that might block their migration, like a dam or a road, but you're not colonizing them into new places. But the second kind of migration that biologists are thinking about right now is called assisted colonization, which is the effort to move wildlife to locations where they've never been recorded before, but where warming may create future habitats that meet their ecological needs. So that's incredibly controversial, as you can imagine. So the wildlife biologists that I partner with pay a lot of attention to the logistical challenges of these projects, which are significant. But environmental historians can add another key element to the conversation, and that's historic context. So it turns out we've been trying to move reindeer around the world for a really long time, more than three centuries. Global reindeer translocations have a long and sometimes problematic history. Moving wildlife around the world has never been just about taking one individual or herd and putting it somewhere else. Rather, it's always involved questions of power, social relations, and visions of a desired future. So as Peter Roberts and Dolly Jorgensen argue, since the 17th century, wildlife translocations have been tools of Norwegian colonial power to assert Norway's aspirations. And that's true not just of Norway, it turns out, but a lot of other European colonial powers and North American as well. So it's, I was interested to find out that reindeer translocations have been core to these much bigger colonial projects of extraction and settler colonialism. 
colonial powers translocate, translocated reindeer and typically their indigenous Sami herders to distant islands, first to provide protein for whaling labor forces and then to provide a reliable food source for European settlers. So exploring the successes and failures of earlier reindeer locations, translocations, will improve the chances that climate change motivated translocations will be socially and ecologically successful. So why reindeer first? So reindeer and caribou, as I mentioned, are the same species. There are 10 subspecies. Here's an image of the a map of, um, of the Arctic. So there are 10 subspecies, including uh, reindeer, which are the semi-domesticated version. There are barren grounds caribou in the North American Arctic, woodland caribou across many other regions. So they're members of the deer family, which includes white-tailed deer, red deer, elk, moose. Reindeer caribou thrive in a variety of different habitats. So um, many conservation organizations, particularly government ones, such as the um, Canadian, federal, and particularly Ontario provincial organizations, are completely ready to give up on caribou, especially woodland caribou, arguing that woodland caribou in particular are doomed in the face of climate change, especially in Ontario. So we should just triage and focus on species with a better chance. But in climate ghosts, I argue that reindeer and caribou are not at all doomed because of climate change itself. Physiologically, they respond with a lot of resilience to rising temperatures. So for example, they're able to forage even in 35 degrees Celsius temperatures, unlike moose, say, which can't really forage very well above 20 degrees Celsius. Reindeer and caribou do prefer lichens as winter forage when available, and those are endangered from climate change in their current range. But it turns out reindeer and caribou can thrive on other forage when necessary. They've evolved migration as a response to past climate change. So for example, they are one of the very few large megafauna species that survived massive climate change during the Pleistocene. Muskoxen are one of the few others. So they, they survived. Seems like we're all frozen. Not quite sure. It's, well, we're ch checking on it and we'll see if we can get Lancy back pretty soon. Just uh, hold on for a second. Unmute. Okay. Great, you're back again. We lost you for a second there. Sounds good. I have no <laughs> idea why. I'm going back to sharing the screen. Can you see the screen again now? Yeah, we can. Great. Sounds great. Sounds okay. Good. Yeah, rural communities. Anyway, so at the end of the Pleistocene, caribou moved north. That enabled people to move north with them because people could eat caribou and the caribou reindeer could eat the grasses that were emerging in the face of melting ice and snow. So according to the great anthropologist Piers Vitebsky at Cambridge, who wrote this book, Reindeer People, best academic book ever written, I can easily say it was caribou that made um, human life possible across the Arctic and the boreal north as climate changed in the late Pleistocene, allowing people to thrive in ecosystems which would otherwise have been uninhabitable. And what's fascinating about that all of a sudden, okay, is as caribou reindeer moved into these melting ecosystems, an incredible diversity of human reindeer relationships developed. So in what's now Mongolia and Siberia, where I worked with Smithsonian colleagues before COVID hit, um, I used to work with nomadic herders that had been displaced by mining and by conservation policies. So in Mongolia and Siberia, indigenous peoples domesticated 
Many reindeer quite closely for food and transport, for milking them and riding them, as you see in this image. And they hunted other herds of wild ranging reindeer. In contrast, in Sápmi, which is northern Finland, Sweden, and Norway, and parts of Russia, the Sami people continue to hunt rather than domesticate reindeer well into the 16th century. But when Europeans colonized Sápmi for mineral, forest, and agricultural resources, wild reindeer populations declined. And the Sami at that point in the 16th century developed a semi-domesticated relationship with reindeer to protect their remaining populations, shepherd them, them on their long migrations, but never fully taming them as beasts of burden. And then in North America, the Anishinaabe here in the Great Lakes region and the Gwich'in um, in Western North America and many other indigenous peoples across North America never domesticated reindeer. Instead, they created very close kinship relationships as hunters. So there are lots and lots of stories that continue among my Anishinaabe neighbors and many, many indigenous peoples in North America that humans and caribou share their hearts. In the past, they were able to shape, shape shift across these species boundaries and help each other out in times of famine. And so these stories of past time continue to guide communities today. So what's kind of interesting is the Euro there was a European American 20th century utter fascination with domestication. And it was conceived of as a way to save indigenous peoples. And it assumed that history went one way from hunting and gathering, which was classified as barbarism, to civilization, which including domesticating wildlife into livestock and to tame creatures. But what's really interesting is across the North, different human cultures developed an incredible diversity of human relationships with reindeer, some domesticated, some do semi-domesticated, some fully wild. And these never existed in a simple historical progression. Indigenous people and reindeer have been fluid in their choices moving back and forth between wild hunting and domesticating herding, depending on a constellation of political and ecological factors that favor different strategies at different times. Yet these categories of wild versus tame were profoundly shaped the colonial state's efforts to think about wildlife and use them as tools of domestication. So since the 17th century, I'm sorry, the 18th century, the late 1700s, as I mentioned, reindeer translocations have been core to colonial projects of extraction and settlement across the North. So there have been at least 30 different attempts at reindeer translocations all across the globe. Typically the sites that the reindeer originate from are in red in what's Satme or Fennel, Scandinavia. And the sites where they've been sent to are in green. And you'll see there's one here in the um, South Georgia Island that I'll talk about. There are others in the Fagulin Islands in the Southern Hemisphere. So initially translocated reindeer, the first big translocation project happened in 1771. Um, and there's a series of Icelandic scholars such as Unar Karlsdottir, Karen Uslin, Kristin Kastrup, and I'm really relying on their work here. But they have shown that Icelandic settlers and elites in Iceland were really interested in Enlightenment European projects of agriculture, modernization, and improvement to try and rationalize the North. So Iceland did not have indigenous peoples. It did not have large mammals. Um, but it did have settlers, and it had become imagined within the rest of Europe as this wild, monstrous place by the late 1700s, a savage place where, where Europeans went and became savage, became like native peoples in other places. And the ways that Europeans sort of defined Icelanders as not quite fully human was they a, shared wives and they shared animals. Um, they lived communal lives. So to construct a more civilized Iceland, authorities decided it would make sense to import European sheep, which would somehow teach the Icelanders to become civilized again as they had been before they left. Um, but these imported sheep unfortunately brought with them some devastating sheep diseases 
that spread to the local sheep that Icelanders had brought with them centuries before that had gone semi-feral. So what that meant was these imported diseases led to massive die-offs of sheep. The famines it began, it was coupled with plague and smallpox, then the little ice age, tossed in a few volcanic eruptions. These were kind of difficult times to say the least. So at that point in 1771, Icelandic elites began proposing that we needed reindeer instead of sheep because they would not be vulnerable to these introduced diseases. They were seen as tougher, able to take care of themselves in the mountainous regions, less vulnerable to disease, and they could feed the rural population. So there were four translocations starting in 1771, and initial efforts kind of failed because even without native Icelandic predators, there are no wolves or bears or other predators, no lynx. The reindeer found themselves in this really different habitat. So they fell off cliffs, they stumbled into boiling geysers, they got lost in lava fields. 1771's first introduction, basically they all fell off the cliff of this island. 1773 herds struggled as well. 1776, they tried for the third time and it finally met with success. So the problem was that local farmers were a little frustrated with the reindeer. They really liked their sheep. Their sheep helped define who they were in this place. They saw reindeer as wild and foreign and sheep were familiar. And soon the reindeer herd became large enough to kind of annoy these Icelandic um, sheep herders. They believed their reindeer degraded pasture that could otherwise sustain their domestic horses and sheep. And the colonial powers had imagined that reindeer would be great because they could take advantage of all this lichen in Iceland, which seemed perfect for reindeer, and it is perfect for reindeer. And the colonial powers thought, well, civilized people don't eat lichen, but surely they will eat reindeer. What they didn't realize was much of the Icelandic peasantry actually relied on lichen for survival. They cooked it for hours and hours and hours, treated it in a number of ways, made a stew with it that was not exactly tasty, but could sustain life during the hardest times. So these Icelandic uh, rural folks began to see the reindeer as competitors for limited food sources. When it got really cold, the reindeer began to migrate down from the highland to pastures close to farms. Icelanders were furious. An animal they saw as wild was invading their homes, their families. And so Icelanders began to hunt the reindeer rather than herd them, and more and more tensions developed. The reindeer never fulfilled the Danes' colonial dreams of a sustainable alternative to sheep, an animal that could conveniently go feed itself. Um, the herd has persisted. There's one free-ranging feral herd that survives in the East Fjords, and their herd size is managed with hunting permits and the revenues go to local communities. So local communities now really approve of the reindeer. Um, and the herd is also, to be honest, managed with car crashes since the only predators on the island are people. So this was a, a translocation, which eventually met with success as defined by a herd that could sustain itself and a group of people who were happy to have them here. But it took centuries of effort. The next big reindeer translocation project was one really focused on industrial extraction rather than on settler colonialism as the Iceland project was. So industrial extraction was core, as we all know, to the growth of colonial powers and extractive industries faced some really huge challenges in trying to feed their itinerant labor forces. And reindeer seemed to be the perfect solution because again, they could wander off and feed themselves when hoped. So South Georgia Island is very close to Antarctica. If you know your Shackleton, it's where Shackleton had some really bad times. So it, and it was home to the world's largest whaling station. Um, in the early 20th century, the island was leased to a Punta Arenas company. And after some really complex political negotiations, became under the power of Norway, which always caused tensions uh, between Britain, between Norway, and between various um, municipalities in South America. But Carl Anton Larsen, one of Norway's great sea captains, 
forged ahead anyway. So when Norway's claims to territory expansion in Antarctica completely failed, Anton said, fine, I'm going to give up my Norwegian citizenship and claim British citizen rights. When that kind of failed, he said, fine, I'll become Argentine. I'm not picky about who I'm with. I just want to develop this massive reindeer, sta uh, massive whaling station. So in 1894, he was on a trip, a shipping trip, investigating the possibility of hunting whales in the Antarctic. And he observed an enormous concentration of whales around South Georgia Island, right whales, and decided that he could make a profit here. So um, whales were so plentiful and easy to catch. He caught 195 whales in the first season with his workforce. That Larson's company had no trouble keeping up with the increasing demand for whale oil. Um, so a few years later, by 1906, there was already international concern that the industry might wipe out local whale populations. So a licensing system was introduced rules dictating that the entire carcass had to be used. So Larson's Whaling Company found a way around these regulations by building a series of factory ships where the whales could be pulled on board just outside of the territory boundaries and processed at sea. So he was a very innovative folk person. Um, and Larson soon decided by 1911 that he had to do something to entertain his workforce. He decided that they were drinking too much on weekends and they were really, really getting sick of the taste of whale meat and fish. So he decided that he could just bring reindeer over from Norway, where he was from after all, and basically use them to entertain his labor force and to feed their labor force. So in 1911, he you know, hired some ecologists, found some lichen on the islands and said, hey, let's bring them here. And he applied for this permit. Sorry, it's probably too small to read. And I, it's not really clear he actually got the permit, but he brought the reindeer anyway. He brought over just seven individuals. Um, his whaling labor force was, were not very good hunters. So soon those seven turned into 3,000. Um, and he arranged two more translocations to bring in viable herds. And reindeer ranged into the snowy highlands. Whaling parties soon learned to be better hunters and kept the herds in check. And there were a whole series of glaciers that kept the reindeer away from a really large population of penguins, which are ground nesting birds. But 1980, 1960s, the whaling station closed. The reindeer herd had no predators. It expanded again to over 7,000 individuals by the 1980s. And the problem was there were increasing encounters between penguin and reindeer. And that was because climate change began to melt the glaciers that had separated them. So encounters between these reindeer and penguins began to increasingly disturb wildlife biologists from the islands. Concerns that reindeer were non-native, that their grazing was trampling native birds, reducing habitat for penguins, marble merlots, a host of other um, mi migratory birds. So these encounters became really politically fraught after the Falkland or Malvinas War, when the British Royal Navy captured an Argentine submarine at South Georgia Island, and the islands became a British overseas territory. So the reindeer began to stand in for colonial powers in other words. So in 2011, the new territorial government decided reindeer had to be eradicated, that they were alien, they were colonial animals, they were invasive pests, <clears throat> as problematic as the Norway rats, which had also found their way to the region. So the decision was made to eradicate both reindeer and rats. So they used poison to kill off all the rats, or most of the rats, Reindeer were more challenging. So the territorial com commissioner went to Sweden and hired 10 Sami herders who had been herding reindeer for many generations and their family. So they spent two weeks on the islands herding the reindeer into corrals. And this is what Sami do before they do a whole host of marking reindeer, slaughtering some of them. It's never used to kill off an entire herd. But um, at that point, the commissioners told the Sami to go away, and they sent out Norwegian sharpshooters to kill each and every individual, all 7,000 plus in the corrals, much to the fury of the Sami, who had not been told of this detail in the plan, 
who really disagreed with the scientific assessments of overgrazing and felt that it was far too close to home to some really controversial reductions of Sami herds that were underway in Sotme at that time. So part of what's really interesting about this project is it's what anthropologist James Blair calls this transnational experiment to apply indigenous knowledge of the environment to eradicate species deemed non-native with settlers reinventing themselves as natives through new forms of governance over the ecosystem. And the eradication project sparked numerous tensions. Neighboring Falkland Islanders were furious because they felt that the reindeer had served as the living link to quote, the prior glory of whaling. And they felt that their history, their settler colonial history was being erased. So they snuck over to South Georgia Island, literally in the dark of night with some landing vessels from the Falklands War. And they smuggled a few reindeer off, took them to the Falklands where they have established a new small herd. And France now is looking at this and says, oh, maybe we have an obligation to eradicate our colonial past. So they're thinking of going to the Southern Indian Island and eradicating reindeer they introduced to the Kerguelen Islands. So South Georgia and Iceland were not homes for indigenous peoples before Europeans arrived. But within territories claimed already by indigenous peoples, introducing European reindeer became deeply entangled in efforts to police the boundaries between what's wild and what's domesticated, what was deemed as savage, what was deemed as, as, um, as civilized. So there's a set of Canadian scholars, including John Sandlos, Lisa Piper, Jonathan Ludi, who've done really extraordinary work on these attempted introductions. So I lean really heavily on their work here, and I'll just talk about this very briefly. But in essence, by the late 19th century, mining, fur trade, land seizures had disrupted, disrupted migration routes of barren grounds caribou, while climate fluctuations were also shaping fluctuations in herd size. And European American settler colonialists believed that wild caribou were going to go extinct. And they blamed indigenous hunters for the crashes, believing indigenous hunters were, quote, acting like wolves, killing without, quote, civilized restraint. So indigenous Northern people's colonial powers feared were going to follow wild caribou into extinction. So, for example, in the 1862 report of the Secretary of Agriculture, Smithsonian scientist Spencer Baird noted that when wild caribou populations declined, indigenous people suffered, leaving, quote, a few half-starved, miserable Indians in the depths of poverty and degradation. So Baird recommended that domesticated European reindeer with their Sami herders be brought to North America to replace wild caribou, provide a sustainable food source, but most importantly, teach the indigenous peoples of North America how to become ranchers, how to become farmers, how to become civilized in the ideas of Europeans. So they decided that it would work much better if they brought Sami herders themselves, rather than just trying to bring wild herds without any humans to guide them. Um, but it turns out translocating reindeer and Sami reindeer people to North America proved endlessly complex. Sami families were often very eager to come on these translocations, partly because of the intense racism they faced in Sami in Northern Scandinavia. But when the reindeer and their Sami herders, if they survived the sea journey from Europe to North America, it turned out the introduced reindeer didn't really believe in this boundary between wild and tamed. They almost immediately picked up and merged in with the wild caribou herds and became caribou instead of reindeer. And the Inuit, it turns out, have very little desire to become pastoralists. And the irony was that there was this vision of the Europeans of settling the Inuit, transforming them into settled pastoral civilized people. But in order to herd the reindeer in these areas of Alaska and eventually Mackenzie Delta in Canada, it turned out you had to move six times a year with the herd. That to be settled, you had to become suddenly nomadic. And the Inuit, who 
these were coastal communities living in very settled communities that they had lived in for many generations. They had no desire to go hang out in tents during these, you know, pretty intense weather systems. So the Sami instead prospered in this region. Um, they herded the reindeer that survived, that stayed close, and reindeer have now become a tourist attraction rather than a source of protein or jobs for local Inuit. So the failures of the project, partly because, you know, came from blurred boundaries between wild and domesticated. Sami prospered, creating little Sotmis for themselves. Domesticated reindeer often left to join wild herds, sometimes came back to the more settled herds. Um, and then there were all sorts of efforts to replicate this in the Mackenzie Delta, which also had some very similar outcomes. So there's another project that I've become really fascinated with that I call complicated, um, complicated colonialism. And this is where instead of colonial powers, you know, bringing Sami and their reindeer to other places to civilize other places, instead it was a fascinating twist where the Sami originated and took control of a project. And this happened in 1947, a Sami reindeer herder named Mikkel Utsi visited the Scottish Highlands with his wife, who was an anthropologist, Dr. Ethel Lindgren, who was a Canadian, U.S., um, Scottish person. And she had some Swedish um, origin as well. She had worked extensively with Mongolian nomadic reindeer herders and with Sami herders in Sami. So they had fallen in love during some of her field work, and then they started traveling the world. Um, and Mr. Utsi got to Scotland and was really struck by the similarity of the Scottish Highlands to reindeer pastures in Sotme. But he was even more struck by the meat rationing going on in the UK at the time. He felt deeply sorry for the Scots, who seemed to be starving for meat in post-World War II rationing. And he thought, you poor things, if only you had some reindeer and some people intelligent enough to know how to herd reindeer. So they negotiated for five years with British authorities. Dr. Lindgren ran the negotiations. She had profound connections with the War Office. And finally, in 1952, a uh, project was approved and Mr. Utsi introduced a small group of reindeer from his family's herd over in Sotme and brought them over to the, rainland, to the highlands. Dr. Lindgren was integral to the project and its successes. She never learned to herd, but as an anthropologist, it turned out she had deep intelligent and military connections, and she was able to mobilize Cold War fears into British acceptance of the project. So British authorities, not just Mr. Utsi, feared a meat famine across the North, feared the lack of meat would lure democratic peoples into communism, which may sound strange, but there's a lot of historic ideas about lack of meat leading to revolutionary changes. So the Brits agreed eventually after five years to the project based archival records suggest on hopes that Dr. Lindgren could establish a network, not just of meat across the North to fight communism, but a network of intelligence centers centered in these reindeer projects across the North. So for example, she and Mr. Utsi did a lot of trips back and forth to Canada, establishing these networks of scientific investigation and military collaborations through reindeer projects, shaped profoundly by Cold War concerns about growing Soviet expansion into the Arctic. Mr. Utsi was in charge of the actual herding of the project, and he brought close herding techniques to the highlands based on his very deep knowledge of individual reindeer. So for example, this lead reindeer, this is Mr. Sark here with a bug net. This is right here, Sark, and Sark was his favorite reindeer. Sark was a castrated male. So the British authorities were like, you can't bring in a castrate. How is the castrate gonna breed? What a ridiculous idea. But Mr. Utsi said, no, I know Sarek well, and Sark knows me well. He trusts me, and the other reindeer trust Sarek. So the only way this is going to be a success, Utsi said, is if there's trust, if there are relationships, and the core of those relationships is my knowledge and Sarek's knowledge of each other. So what's really interesting is the reindeer, like most semi-domesticated reindeer across Sotme, 
were independent agents. The reindeer were never in control or were never controlled by herders. Instead, the herders closely observed the reindeer. This is just a five days worth of map from one herder. It's probably too small to see, but watching and mapping the movements of individual reindeer. So the herders would go up into the highlands, camp in little tents, and follow the reindeer from pasture to pasture, providing them some protection from predation, which were mostly dogs, um, and just basically keeping track of them, giving them some protection, especially during calving. They would follow their movements across the mountains, guide them to winter pasture when the snows came, protect them from wolves, and also help protect them from the flies that came in swarms during particularly humid months. So over years of intensive partnerships in a new land, the reindeer and the Utsi Lindgren families prospered. So you can still go visit this reindeer project. It's an extraordinary experience. Mr. Utsi brought over many of his Sami nephews and cousins who would typically come for several seasons and then return home with experience and funds to create their own families and herds within Sami. So Mr. Utsi and Dr. Lindgren had to really carefully negotiate relationships, not just with the reindeer, but also with their neighbors in sheep herding families, with elite landowners who controlled hunting of competing red deer, bureaucrats who worried about possible harm to forestry plantations that were non-native spruce, and to military authorities across the UK. So this is just one um, image of what they spent a lot of time doing, which is introducing reindeer to local school children to build support for the project. So this is Mr. Utsi, and he has his favorite reindeer, Sarek, with him. And these are three local school children in 1952, just one of many, many similar images. So the reindeer herd prospered with their close care. They control their populations right now, not so much by hunting, not by selling it for meat, but instead by contraceptives and by selective breeding. Their main form of care is treating them with anti-fly medications because as the climate warms, flies become more and more of a problem. So according to the Utsi and the Lindgrens, these are not purely wild reindeer, but they're free ranging. They're native, but they're also introduced. But now under increasing interest in rewilding Scottish Highlands, some conservationists want to kill off the reindeer, just as was done in South Georgia Island. But it becomes a really interesting historical argument because it turns out reindeer are actually native to Scotland, unlike South Georgia Island. So the question is, when did they last go extinct? Because they have been extinct for a while. And a very lively scholarly debate has developed over this. A bunch of archaeologists say reindeer survived until 800 years ago. And they were killed off by hunting and by farming. So there's a set of medieval Orkney sagas. There's a set of reindeer antlers across um, Scotland. But other anthropologists and archaeologists say, no, 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 those were just trade items from Norway. Reindeer were actually driven to extinction 8,000 years ago by natural climate change. And this may seem like a pretty classically academic debate, but it has huge repercussions for the reindeer themselves and for their herders, because it's probably going to determine whether they retain the right to graze within Scotland, at least within the national park. So there are these endless tensions and contradictions. What is fully wild? What is tame? What should our relationships with other species be? What is invasive? How do these fluid categories shape conservation today? So after millennia of adaptation to changing environments and changing relations with people, reindeer now face some really grave challenges across the North. And in 2003, the eminent ecologist Valerius Geist argued that broad public support and determined effort by volunteers is essential for wildlife conservation. And he said we need to base that on our understanding of these deep connections for millennia between human histories and reindeer histories. Reindeer hunting featured prominently in the rise of modern humans and the demise of Neanderthals in their upper Paleolithic, quote, the colonization by humans of paraglacial environments during the last glaciation depended on reindeer. Modern humans, he argues, owe much of what they are now 
to reindeer, at least in the north. And so we need to reciprocate. So there's a lot of fascinating work going on now about the origins of art um, in Europe coming from these relationships with reindeer. There's a great British museum publication called Swimming Reindeer that looks in detail at their oldest artifact in the British Museum, which is a carving from uh, more than 15,000 years ago of reindeer that they argue really indicates this incredibly close connection. But the key point here is reindeer and people tied together the landscapes of the North, physical, biological, economic, and cultural. Reindeer were never just commodities. They were never just wildlife. They were never just food. They were above all kin. They were more than human animals who live in relationship with each other and with humans. And so for hundreds of years, and even now, powers have tried to control grazing herds of reindeer that indigenous communities manage. And in many of those attempts to control, especially in Satme, outsiders see domesticated reindeer as just plain old livestock that are overgrazing, consuming ecosystem services, need to be eradicated in conservation areas. So when I was in Mongolia, that was the exact thing that was happening with indigenous duca reindeer herding communities. But what's interesting is now European scientists are finally realizing what indigenous peoples have been telling them all along. Reindeer grazing can help the North. Grazing herbivores are favoring, as I said before, rather than destroying grasses. And when we talk about reindeer and caribou, it's too vulnerable to be sustained in the Anthropocene with climate change. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. We become reluctant to invest in restoring them. For that suggests continuing care, continuing intervention with people and reindeer. But as indigenous communities who have long lived with reindeer say that reindeer and humans, humans and caribou have had millennia, many, many, many thousands of years of interrelationships, that if we need to help them on their migrations now, we should do that. And I got into this project when the Michipacatan First Nations community contacted me for help with the Ontario ministry, which was not allowing them to translocate a herd and Lake Superior Basin that was about to be extirpated. The Ontario ministry said, but that's not wild, that will make them tame. And the Chippecotton First Nations community said, enough with these boss boundaries between wild and tame. If caribou and reindeer are going to thrive, they said, we need to think our cultural assumptions about wildness and wildlife. They argued that we need to understand that human stewardship in relation with, mi with migratory more than human animals is going to be essential. People in caribou have had intertwined histories for millennia and will now need to continue caring for them, investing time, resources, energy to manage their predators, to protect migrating herds and corridors, and possibly to continue to translocate individuals when populations are at risk. So I want to close by saying that humans emerge in relationship with other species and with places, with the many homes we make in our world, with what environmental humanists like to call multi-species entanglements. So one of our core tipping points that we might face could become our increasing distance from other species and places, which can lead to belief that other animals and ecosystems are just tools, services, instruments for human use. But that's not the only way to see our relationship with other species. I think we can and we must learn from indigenous communities who continue to work with and indeed manage reindeer and caribou across the north. Translocating migratory species to new places has a great potential to work if we remember to see those other animals as partners and kin as we figure out paths into a more sustainable future. So thank you very much. And I think we have time for questions. Let me get out of screen share. So can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, good. Okay, I was worried. There we go. Let's turn that off. But now you can't see the screen, right? We can see you on the screen. Good. We can't see your slides. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Nancy, very much for that. Uh, 
I don't recall another talk in which we were taken around the world and crossed the blurry lines between species uh, boundaries and also were treated to uh, original artwork by the presenter of uh, a deeply historical talk. So thank you for all of those things. Uh, you have certainly given us much to think about and to wrestle with. But towards the end of your talk, when you were proceeding in a more reflective vein, you raised the point about the importance of recognizing the complexity of our existence in multi-species relationships. And you know, fundamentally, I think that this is something that we collectively uh, really do need to probe more deeply uh, into. Uh, I think this may be the first, possibly second time, this issue of the ways in which humans are imbricated with the rest of, of uh, Earth and earthly beings has been raised so explicitly. And it does seem to me that that is probably one of the keys that we need to uh, really engage with if we are going to be successful in what is really part of the agenda of the nature and climate emergency program, which is to think our way to and, and through the challenges that the earth and the people in it are facing. So thank you for that point. I hope others will pick up on it as well. Um, there is one question already in the chat. It's on a somewhat different tack, but perhaps I can ask you that one uh, while people are thinking about some of these broader implications. Uh, this question asks whether the problem of caribou decline in the Arctic regions is something that is being discussed on the Circumpolar Council, uh, since all the members of that council are those that have reindeer populations uh, within their borders. I, I don't know whether you have any information on that, but it certainly would take us back to the issue of the imbrication of a whole series of political and other considerations in any uh, step to address these issues. Yes, absolutely. The Circumpolar Council often considers the, the sustainability of reindeer and caribou herds across the Arctic. It's a key issue for many members of the council, as you note, and it's a continuing issue with lots of policy declarations. And indeed, there are thousands and thousands of researchers and community members engaged in reindeer herding or in caribou hunting who frequently address these questions. Um, so at the moment in Canada, and I can't remember exactly where in Canada, there's the biennial every other year meeting of the International Reindeer um, uh, Researcher um, Community, which is finally inviting lots of indigenous researchers and people who live with reindeer, and it's focused on indigenous relationships with reindeer, caribou, and what we can learn from that to overcome this false dichotomy that, that wild animals need to be preserved by keeping them as wild as possible, which just simply doesn't work for reindeer and caribou anymore in a warming world and probably doesn't work for most other species. So one of the interesting messages from that meeting is that if we're a little more humble um, show some a little more humility and allow and sort of consider that other animals on earth might actually be part of these solutions, might actually have interesting ways to slow climate change, um, and that other kinds of knowledge systems might help us protect those species and indeed, you know, engage in seeing them as, as producers of ecosystem services rather than users. That's a long way away. I'm involved right now with an EU project called Just North, which works with Sami herders across Sápmi, across the Arctic, um, who are very, very frustrated by the radical expansion of wind energy projects across Scandinavia right now, which are essential for a green transition, but get typically put in the territories of Sápmi, of, of herders. Um, and it turns out reindeer 
herding and wind developments don't really go together all that well. And the powerful effect on reindeer of these wind turbines comes from cumulative effects. As a group of herders told us last week in, um, in, in Sweden, that it's one sort of strike after another. There's first this mine, and then there's this energy development, then there's this infrastructure project, and then all of a sudden there are all these wind developments. So the Sami are really enthusiastic about helping lead to a green transition, but they say you can't do that at the expense of reindeer, because reindeer have to be key partners in the fight for climate change. It's possible to think, you know, not just to pick reindeer lands as the place for your wind turbines because there aren't many people there and you know planners are trying to avoid having to negotiate with people with human infrastructure so they say oh look it's a wild empty space just a few wildlife let's stick the turbines there so that's just another example if you see this absolute boundary between wild and tame human and non-human empty and full um, it's easy to make really big mistakes about where you site these clean you know these uh, re renewable energy projects needed for a clean transition. So that was a long-winded answer to a simple question. The answer is yes. <laughs> it is. <laughs> thank, thank you, Nancy. The okay. last part of your, your answer really leads in very nicely to the next question, which yeah. is from Bill Reese, a member of our cohort, and of course the originator of the ecological footprint uh, idea. Uh, he says anthropocentrism, utilitarianism, and instrumentalism, which were three key words that came out of your last few words, mm -hmm. are at the core of techno-industrial society's worldview and relationship with nature. What is the probability of overcoming the momentum this represents in time to make a climate difference? Is, Bill asks, modern society inherently unsustainable? Um, I would say the answer to that is no, because I think modern society is made up of lots of different cultures um, who have lots of different ways of viewing the rest of the world. So for example, the Sami herding groups that I'm doing some work with right now, um, I'm putting together an ecosystem services part of these negotiations. And most of the, um, American ecologists I know say, oh, ecosystem services, it's all instrumental values. It's all just sort of seeing other parts of nature as purely instrumental, that they're just, it's purely utilitarianism. But um, the indigenous communities that I work with, they're like, no, it's a really useful tool because it, it starts with this understanding that humans are fully dependent on ecosystems, that we're fully enmeshed in ecosystems, that our ability to survive grows out of the services produced by those ecosystems. We are part of them. We're embedded within them. And they say, sure, we look at reindeer as instruments. Um, you know, we use them to survive. They're, you know, we eat them. But they're also much more than just instruments. They are kin. They are relationships. There are lots of fluid relationships with caribou. So I think some of our, I mean, the boundaries I grew up in, you know, as a settler American, which is that it's either family or something completely different. It's human or basically an instrument. Um, are part of Western culture, but they're not the only part of modern society today. And I think there's lots of efforts. I see ecologists making tremendous efforts to partner, to work closely with indigenous communities. There's um, so many indigenous community members who are training as wildlife ecologists, training as policymakers. So they're really able to blend these different ways of seeing together and make a huge difference. So I'm actually really hopeful. Thanks, Nancy. I'm not sure that uh, Bill will be persuaded. Uh, I don't That's know cool. whether you have the chat open, but he, mm -hmm. he makes the observation that your wind turbine uh, reindeer story uh, really drives home uh, or illustrates his point in the previous right. question. Bill, right. I don't know right. if you right. wait, want wait, wait, to... Wait, wait, wait. I want to jump in there, Bill, because you're completely right that the wind turbine reindeer story does illustrate your question, but it il or illustrates your, your point. But I think it also illustrates my point, because here were a group of planners 
from mostly Sweden, but also Norway and some in Finland who said, we know the perfect place to stick these wind turbines. And they didn't just stick them there. They consulted with local community who said, you're out of your mind. No. Um, and there are policy mechanisms. Those wind turbines are not being cited there anymore. Um, and so, yes, people who were, you know, came out of one particular framework. Um, and I completely agree. We need wind turbines. Um, but there are lots of different places you can cite them. And so the planners were willing, partly because they were forced to by EU law, to rethink their assumptions. They had all these cool quantifications about here's the best place to cite them. But those were based on a set of assumptions about what reindeer were and what they weren't. But luckily, I, th I think Part of what gives me hope is we have growing regulatory structures and frameworks that say, okay, time to get back to the drawing board, consult with local communities, and rethink your assumptions, which aren't working for people. I mean, if you asked me about U.S. policies, I would be much more gloomy. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, do you want to unmute yourself and join a verbal discussion here with Nancy? Not to put you on the spot, Bill. I don't see where Am I there? Yes, you are. But where are you? I don't see your face. My camera. There we go. Oh, All there right. you are. Hi. Okay, listen, I don't dispute what you're saying uh, about the whole story that you've laid out, but it seems to me that the Sami and, and Native North Americans, including in, in our own Arctic Canada, are not really representative of mainstream modern techno industrial society. And over time, they're losing. What could possibly happen to, to, for example, move the whole global development scenario away from neoliberal economics, which assumes uh, the, the conditions I mentioned of anthropocentrism, utilitarianism, infinite growth aided by technological advances. And by the way, windmills, wind turbines, while we may think of them as necessary, are neither renewable nor green. And so it's just a perpetuation of the mainstream industrial dynamic in, in an attempt to maintain business as usual, which is what's destroying the natural world around us and which will take us down in the end. That's my... <laughs> That's your view. You know, I hear you about that, Bill, and I've shared those perspectives at times in my own darkest nights of the soul with me and a bottle of bourbon and my husband saying, stop, stop, let's go for a paddle. <laughs> it's too depressing. But but no, I, I actually, I mean, partly, I, you know, I've done all this work on, well, what for the U.S. is as far north as you can get practically, the Lake Superior Basin. And it's easy to get really depressed because, you know, there is, in my Sustaining Lake Superior, I detail all the way these grand ambitions just, you know, fall apart eventually. Um, zero toxic discharge. It was such a great idea that the IJC moved forward with the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. And you can read 30 pages of gory detail about why it didn't work um, and how neoliberal economics and assumptions of technocratic supremacy just sort of pulled it apart. But the other thing I learned from research on that book and my work in recent years on other projects is that there are so many communities around the Great Lakes, around Satme, around the North, who are working so hard, both settler and indigenous communities, to, to pay attention to other kinds of values and to not have these absolute boundaries between instrumental versus intrinsic. I mean, those are sort of dualistic categories that I'm not sure they serve us that well anymore. I think we all, you know, we all consume, we all see other things as instruments, but at the same time, we see at least uh, some members of our community as more than instruments having their own value. And, you know, I've lived in Wisconsin for 18 years. I've spent a lot of time at Aldo Leopold Shack doing restoration projects and time with his family. And, you know, in some ways, what we're talking about is extending a land ethic much more broadly. Um, and it's not something we need to invent. We don't need to invent these new philosophical traditions of seeing humans and more than humans as kin. Those have been there for a really, really long time and continue to persist. And I sort of feel like giving up hope means giving up on 
all this incredible work that local communities are doing. So, Olive, you say no. You well, have something that says no above you. <laughs> I don't know what that means. One, just one final technological error. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought that was a great way of saying I disagree with you, Langston. <laughs> anyway, sorry. I've, I've worked in the far north as well, and I, I share many of the values that you've expressed about various groups of people who are trying to make a difference. I see them as the lifeboats, but the mainstream is the Titanic and it's going down. And uh, they, those people may well survive because they're developing ways of being in the ecosystems that have sustained them from time immemorial and they will survive. Whereas the mainstream where we live, that's my, uh, assessment of the direction we're going. You know, we've known for 50 years about climate change and overconsumption and biodiversity loss and all the rest of it. But nothing we've done, again, in the mainstream has uh, had any effect on reversing those trends. Carbon dioxide and other emissions are steadily increasing. But You're right about carbon dioxide and emissions are radically increasing, but we have done so much. I mean, Lake Superior was on the verge of tipping over into another Lake Erie. It was really on the verge of irreversible changes from eutrophication and pollution. And communities came together in the 1960s and 70s and stopped that. And it wasn't perfect. There's still lots of problems. It's still the fastest warming lake in the world. Um, but at every meeting I'm at, at every committee I'm at, it, sometimes it just seems like you're spinning wheels. But then if you look back, this place was a cesspool three decades ago. Um, and in some ways, I think conservation is a victory, is a victim of its own success. People forget that the Great Lakes were so polluted, you really couldn't swim or drink or fish in them. And Swim, Drink, Fish is a great organization based in Ontario that's done tremendous work at reversing that. Um, so things are better than they used to be in many ways, not in other ways. Carbon, where it went. I think carbon in, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere I mean, when I was born were 314, and they're a lot higher than that now. <laughs> yeah, I, with you on that. I, I grew up in Toronto, worked for several years on Lake uh, Huron as a fisherman, actually, uh, yeah. experimental bi biological experiment. But uh, what would you say to the argument? I was also on another project where we decided that most of the improvement in air quality and water quality in the Great Lakes Basin was due to the offshoring of dirty industry and, and the various uh, forms of pollutants. So it's a question of having shifted the mess to China and Thailand and India and other places now, which are suffering from the worst pollution on the planet, even as we benefit from that, that offshoring act activity. Yeah, for Lake Superior, that's actually not the case. Um, for Lake Ontario and for Lake Michigan, I'd have to look at the data. You're probably right, because especially um, in places where there are lots and lots of steel mills, we absolutely offshored that. But we're still producing significant amounts of minerals from the Upper Great Lakes Basin. And it's not perfect. It's not being done in a perfect way. But I have to say the nickel mine a few kilometers down the road from here is so infinitely cleaner than the Indonesian nickel mines. And nickel is pretty essential for a clean energy transition. I just spent two hours in a Zoom meeting, uh, actually Microsoft 1.0, whatever silly name it's called, um, with members from the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, all about are we going to become another sacrifice zone for this clean energy transition? Because the world, and especially Tesla and others are eyeing the Upper Great Lakes. It's like, yes, nickel, lithium, what the heck, let's, you know, get some more of this and that. There might even be cobalt. There's no cobalt here. But, you know, there are ways of managing that alternatives, such as pumped underground storage technologies, push technologies. We're basically using abandoned mines as water batteries, rather than having to dig new mines for all these minerals that are needed. So, so I think there are alternatives. You're right, it's fighting an uphill battle. But one thing Graham didn't mention is I did my PhD in evolutionary ecology. I worked over billions of years. Well, I worked mostly with birds. So that was six, you know, 60 million years or so. So I, I learned to take the long view. <laughs> so I really do think the earth bats last, the earth will be fine. Um, it's humans that are have are gonna have trouble adapting. But there's lots of signs that you know humans are learning. I don't know. I have to be optimistic because otherwise 
<laughs> Otherwise, what's the point? But I hear you. And so, much oh, oh, your sorry. Ebullient optimism. So thank you. What did you say? Forced optimism? So ebullient. You're just one of the most bubbly and effervescent optimists I've ever met lately. So. <laughs> That's so funny. Uh. Well, I I would agree with uh, Bill uh, th about that observation, Nancy. Your 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 energy is infectious, and thank you for that. Olaf, you have your hand raised for a question. Well, I finally figured out the technology. Instead of saying no, <laughs> I wanted to raise a, a, a different point, and that was we just uh, concluded. Uh, you use the word kin, uh, Nancy, and I thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, and that seems to me to be at the root of the issue. Do we really recognize kin uh, amongst reindeer? And I have to admit, uh, a Norwegian background and a little story about my own family, which is relevant, even if it seems highly personal. Uh, when, when I was working in, uh, on Spartisen in Northern Norway, and uh, I got mixed up with moving further north uh, in the Arctic zone, uh, my mother uh, was shocked that I would be mixing with this barbarian society. Uh, her view of Sami and of their uh, the relevance to our modern society was, was just primitive. Uh, I must say, I, I still respect my mother greatly, but, but the point is, uh, this group of uh, pioneers, uh, this cohort of uh, odds and ends, thinking about the climate uh, nature emergency has come to a, a partial conclusion with respect to the importance of culture, with the importance of the need for a mind change. And I quote my mother in relation to her views on Sami and reindeer as, a, as an example of something severely uh, constraining. And it raises questions in our mind about, uh, you know, is the, the national representatives on the Arctic Council really relevant um, when it has a majority of people who recognize no kinship whatsoever, even though they're Norwegians who have reindeer in their backyard? Surely this is the big problem beyond all other. And uh, the sooner we can learn to see kinship uh, in not only reindeer, but uh, all other forms of life uh, on this planet, it seems to me that that's, anyway, that's my thought. It's not as, it's not as wise and as well read as, as Bill's, but it's a, it's a very <laughs> Um, yeah, I hear you on that, Olaf. My my father's family were a Scots-Irish family who farmed in Appalachia. You know, they were wonderful people, incredibly kind to their kin, but they never met a chemical they didn't like. You know, they all died of cancer one way or the other. And they were also profoundly, utterly racist. They completely did not see African-Americans as human. Um, and they went to their deathbeds, loving chemicals and hating Black people. And, um, but at the same time, they were my family, they were generous, they were loving. Um, and so how do we come to terms with those kind of past? I, I don't want to say, well, eventually they'll die off because, you know, their children and their grandchildren, you know, still love the place, you know, honor their memory, but also recognize that things had to change. And so I think most, you know, people um, from you know, where my family grew up or where my father's family grew up have come to expand the boundaries of their idea of who is kin, who is community to include much more than just white people, white middle-class farmers like themselves. And that's been a grinding and difficult process. I mean, I'm not, I don't want to minimize how hard it's been, 
um, and how much, you know, the U.S. and the world is still racked by those. I mean, coming to terms with that kind of racism is incredibly difficult. And it certainly happened across Satmi, across Scandinavia. And indeed, part of what I'm so fascinated about by these reindeer projects, reindeer translocations, is how often, you know, they were conceived of as tools, as instruments, both the Sami and the reindeer by the colonial powers, but both the Sami and the reindeer said, hey, you know what? We're agents. We're not just objects. We're going to do what we're going to do. And so Sami often took control of these projects. I mean, there's a whole little Sami throughout Alaska right now. The Sami really flourished. What was sort of interesting is the place where I am now on the Keweenaw Peninsula of Lake Superior was the world's largest copper mining district for many generations. The capital all came from Boston. Um, Harvard became Harvard, became rich because, you know, the money was extracted from here and we're paying this incredible price environmentally in terms of water quality. And the miners brought a large group of Sami to mine here um, for a whole host of interesting reasons. But many Sami were very happy to leave Sami because of the intense racism you mentioned and come here where they could reinvent themselves. And they reinvented themselves as white people, sort of interesting enough, um, because of the racism that had been part of their lives. And after two generations, um, they hadn't seen reindeer in two generations. They were miners. But then when Spencer Baird was trying to do this big project of moving reindeer all over the world, um, it got too expensive to keep bringing Sami all the way from Norway. So he said, hey, there's a bunch of Sami in Michigan. <laughs> Let's go far. They had seen reindeer in their lives and their father's lives and their grandmother's lives. But they're like, sure, whatever. There's probably better opportunity there. So many of them were happy to reclaim their Sami, their reindeer, and go up to Alaska and the Mackenzie Delta and, you know, figure out how to, you know, how to work with reindeer. And, you know, and become Sami again in a new place. And historians, people who look at Sami migrations all over the world, tell these kind of stories over and over and over again. The Sami were much more than just victims of colonial oppression, although that was part of the story. They also created their own histories and future. And they did that and continue to do that in partnership with reindeer. And that's partly why I love the Scottish example so much, because it's still happening. Um, it, you know, it's still going on. I mean, the whole war and Cold War networks are really kind of bizarre, but that's true of so much post-World War II history. Cold War fears and intelligence and military power get so entangled in what happens across the Arctic, especially in Canada, right? Anyway, thanks for that question. Thank you for the answer. Thanks, Nancy and Olaf. If I might just pick up on that, I mean, I do think this is an important issue. And I understand exactly what you're saying, Olaf, and you're saying, Nancy, about earlier generations uh, within one's own family. And, you know, I think we all uh, of this generation uh, understand that. But you're right, Nancy, it seems to me, in, in stressing that this is, this is a generational thing as much as it is a national thing. It's not just Norwegians. Uh, antagonistic towards Sami or Americans antagonistic and racist towards black Americans. Uh, it's people of a particular generation globally, uh, pretty much, who bought into the modernist project and all of those kinds of, of uh, assumptions. But we have come a long way and the rising generation for whom we need to hold out hope and, and prospect is really, by and large, so much more welcoming, un unprejudiced in these ways uh, than our generation and the generation before. So change has happened, uh, but it's not happening in some ways fast enough on this axis that is so important to recognize that we are all earthlings, that our, our kin extends beyond the immediate family, folks who are colored like us, or indeed even all humans, to encompass the the, the more than human world. And, and so that really is the direction I think that we have to move down 
in order to have continuing hope for addressing the future in face of climate change. But clearly, I'd, I'd like to suggest one of the crucial issues here is actually getting out information that allows people to make uh, good and sensible judgments. Because as Bill said earlier, uh, the whole solar uh, alternative electric vehicles, uh, wind turbines and so on, are hardly renewable. They cause their own environmental damage. Uh, they're not the, the green solution that they're purported to be. But only a few people are actually aware of that and are getting the information in that way. And one of one of the ways in which I think this connects with with some of your thinking and writing on on these issues, Nancy, is your your commentary about nuclear power uh, on the niche blog. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, as you say there, most environmentalist concerned people in the West are horrified about nuclear power and wish to shut down nuclear stations. And in fact, this has happened in, in Europe to a great degree. But as you point out, if you really look at risk and hazard and risk and probability, uh, they're not such ogres as, as people would have and may be a part of the solution. So really this ramble is to say, how do we actually get to the point of enlightening people about the, the need to take these steps and to make judicious judgments about the directions in which we proceed? Yeah, I think two ways. I think, you know, working with communities and hearing their concerns and working with their concerns, um, you know, and helping to, to lead to these massive ethical changes. But I really hesitate when people say, oh, well, we can't have any real changes until we have all these massive ethical changes first. People have to stop being so self-centered because, you know, uh, philosophers have been complaining about human nature for many thousands of years. <laughs> it takes a while to change. So all those kind of changes are important. But at the same time, I think policies and laws and rules and regulations, they may seem boring, but they also shape change in profound ways. Understandings of relative risk, as Connie mentioned, I live in her, her former house, in the house she built now. Um, she's right. Wind turbines, like most green energy infrastructure, has a footprint. It's not insignificant. The lifespan of many of these structures, the solar panels on my roof have a lifespan of 30 years. And then what? You know, it's they're not easy to recycle. The battery, you know, that I have in my house has a lifespan of 30 years and they aren't designed yet to be easily recyclable. But laws can change that. The EU now has laws requiring that these EV battery, electric vehicle batteries re redesigned to be easily recyclable. Right now, recycling of EV batteries just dumps everything into basically one big food processor, chops it all up, and then uses acid precipitation techniques to pull out the minerals that can be reused. That's a that's a really stupid way to do it. Um, and so as soon as you have laws and regulations, then you get redesigned. So batteries and turbines are designed in modules that you can put back and forth together. And I agree, you know, existing green infrastructure or you know, existing green technologies are imperfect. They have footprints. There's no doubt about that. But part of what one learns is to evaluate relative risks and relative footprints. Um, and the relative footprint of um, wind turbines in this region is so much less than the footprint of carbon-based, um, car that, what am I trying to say, of natural gas infrastructure in particular. And so solar power is not perfect. Wind's not perfect. Um, I completely agree with that. I'm a real booster for fusion. More and more and more money pulled into fusion. But fusion isn't going to be the sort of, you know, wonder thing that saves us at the last minute. Fusion is also going to need. Um, you know, infrastructure to get energy from point A to point B. We're always going to have a footprint on Earth. And I think our two choices are either let ourselves go extinct or else be figure out how to do the, these infrastructures in as respectful a way as possible. And I certainly hope B wins that in the end, but who knows? <laughs>
So Connie, thanks for your comment about the the footprints of wind turbines. You're right, they have a footprint. Um, and it was intervention by a group of ornithologist bird scientists who noticed they were also impacting migratory birds and bats. And so they pressured simple design shifts to take them right off the ridges. And so you lose only about 1% of the energy generated and to turn them on and off during migration times, especially dawn and dusk, but you lose a really trivial amount of energy compared to the massive reduction in risk to migratory species. Um, so that's an example of how scientific data integrated with concerns by people led to some really important shifts in design. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. I think not seeing any further questions. Oh, wait, um, there's something in the chat. There are a couple of things in the chat. Uh, I appreciate your more, optimism, but yeah, yeah I agree. Uh, there are more comments of that order uh, than, than questions. And obviously, people have enjoyed the presentation very much, uh, and as have I. Uh, Nancy, you have given us not only ebullient enthusiasm, to quote Bill Rees, uh, but also uh, a profound sense of understanding the issues here, and recognizing that they're in some sense intractable, uh, that they're enormously difficult. I don't particularly like the phrase wicked problems, but that's what we uh, face using that term. And uh, to move forward, I think we, we've learned from you today that the, the really important thing to bear in mind is that we are all together stewards of this earth uh, and that collectively, we need to think and work very hard together to make sure that we address the problems that are before us, uh, that there's no one simple quick fix to doing this, uh, that technological innovation is clearly going to be important. Policy changes are vital. And I think increasingly that uh, working through the instruments of government is, uh, as you've said, important in this, but so too, um, I think we need to acknowledge collectively that this adhesion to a business as usual model, the continuing overconsumption of resources uh, for frivolous, uh, unnecessary um, indulgence and luxury is something that we had better collectively uh, begin to recognize we need to do without. Uh, and so, you know, uh, Vaclav Schmiel, the uh, great Canadian energy uh, scholar, uh, wrote some little time ago about what's so bad about going back to the standard of living of 1964, the material standard of living, not the attitudes that prevailed uh, towards other people back then. But, you know, people survived full well with much less, and we made a much less damaging imprint on the globe than we are now. So thank you, Nancy, for raising all of these, these important issues and bringing us some clarity to thinking about them. Uh, it's always a privilege to share time with you. And thank you for sharing time with my colleagues and friends. Thanks so much. Um, and thanks for a stimulating conversation. And Olga asks, how will caribou migrate on melting permafrost where migratory trails currently cover? That's a great question. And they may absolutely need some help from people. Many of the migratory herds in Scott may now have help during parts of their migrations, usually because of other things that have gotten in the way, mining, railroad, large reservoirs, but it's certainly possible. <clears throat> Caribou migrate mostly by protecting their migratory corridors. Caribou are bog, sorry, I love caribou. Caribou, reindeer are bog dependent species. They can make their ways through incredible bogs. And you can actually see the places where the bogs persisted are the places where woodland caribou herds have persisted. You don't think of caribou as wetland dependent species, but at least in Canada, they really are, which is sort of fascinating. So anyway, thanks so much for a live. Thank you. I'm not really as optimistic as I'm pretending to be, but I think it's really <laughs> important to try <laughs> otherwise. Um, you know, I find people who are really 
or when my students get really depressed rather than hopeful, they just consume more or they just sort of say, oh, I'm just going to go work for whatever, Chase Manhattan. And when they're inspired to think, hey, I can design a better wind turbine, I can design a better nuclear plant, I can design a better car, then they go out and lead lives that make a huge difference. So exactly. Hope yes. is essential. That's yeah. uh, that's the downside of, of deep despair. Which, uh, it just leads leads to let's uh, let's party right now while we have the chance. Uh, exactly, or let's go shopping on Amazon yeah, for yeah, junk exactly. and then pay for a storage unit, which is never yeah. a long -term solution. <laughs> Anyways, well, thank you, Nancy. Many, many thanks, Nancy.